is all right that uh, it, that is enforced and can be enforced. Uh, the ginseng season is from September 1st to December 31st. And, you know, you can't collect outside of that season and you can't collect any ginseng plant that have green berries. You know, the, the ginseng that you collect must have red berries. You must replant those uh, berries and you can't take any ginseng that has less than uh, three prongs and those are the leaflets uh, of the plant. And when you harvest ginseng, again, the conservation aspect, make sure you plant those berries back uh, to try to create more ginseng. I, I wish my folks had done that when I was growing up. Some of those um, poisonous plants that you need to be familiar with, some of them, you know, aren't, aren't native. Some of them are, you know, even um, ex exotics and, and some of them are house plants, but English ivy is a poisonous plant. Water hemlock is a poisonous. Poison hemlock is a uh, poisonous. And they both look like Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot. So you really have to be able to discern the difference between um, Queen Anne's lace and, and these guys. Jimson weed is a datura and, and it's poisonous. I don't know if you remember, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the kids were eating the Jimson weed seeds and they thought they were getting high and all they were doing was poisoning themselves. Um, poison ivy, of course, castor bean. I see so much castor bean growing around, you know, and, the, and uh, that's um, poisonous. Larkspur, you know, so delphiniums are, are poisonous. They're in the buttercup family. Uh, which you all know, and a lot of the buttercups are poisonous. And then again, the star of Bethlehem um, looks like little onions, but it's got that little white streak down the blade of, of each um, leaf. And so that makes it star of Bethlehem. So there are more, you know, and I know you guys know how to identify poison ivy, leaves of three, let it be. Uh, but especially this time of year, I've had, I've uh, taken classes out and you have kids and turn around and it's in the fall and there they are with these beautiful red poison ivy leaves. <laughs> You're like, look, these are beautiful and they are, but, but it can still give you poison ivy. Um, and, you know, be sure to, to get a lot of different references to be able to compare notes and to study wild edibles. Um, some of my favorites, uh, this is Billy Joe Tatum. Uh, that's one of my very favorites because it was uh, Sharon Bracey's favorite. And um, the recipes in Billy Joe Tatum's Wild Food Skilled Guide and Cookbook are very easy. Uh, nowadays, you have to kind of get them online from Amazon um, because I don't, they're it's, I think it's out of print, but, but that's still my favorite book. Of course, Sharon's book is one of my favorite books because it's based here in Tennessee. Uh, so Eating Wild with Sharon Bracey um, is a great book. It's always good to have uh, different types of books. You know, the field guides, you know, the Peterson field guides are going to tell you how to identify the plants. Uh, but things like, you know, eating the wild edibles, they're going to have recipes in them. They're going to be have things that's going to tell you how to prepare um, the, the, the plants, the uh, edible wild plants. Um, th this is going to help you um, with the nutritious value, the nutritional value of the different wild edible plants. And so different books have different purposes. And back here, you can see that magic and medicine of plants. Uh, that was just the Reader's Digest book. Uh, but Patty Smith used it to kind of create a program uh, on how, in, how incredibly interesting plants are. So you're really going to have to get a lot of different references. Um, and of course, everybody uh, has uh, or doesn't have, but they're familiar with, with uh, uh, Stalking the Wild Asparagus by Yule Gibbons. And, that, and that's always a, a good read. Um, and it's one of the old tried and trues. But what I'll do now is um, go into some of the, the plants uh, that um, I often harvest and share with other people. Again, these are going to be the easiest plants. So, so as far as learning new plants, you're probably not going to learn new plants tonight. But what you may learn are new purposes for plants you already know. And that's the best of two worlds because you already know them and you don't have to worry about identifying them. But I love uh, violet leaves. Uh, when you take a, a violet leaf, you, you use a, a violet leaf just like you would use lettuce. It's like a very good, um, you know, lettuce like romaine lettuce. It's like a hearty lettuce and it tastes like lettuce. 
Now, when people come and start doing wild edibles in the very beginning, they'll go, well, that tastes like a green plant. And I'll go, well, yeah, I'm using it like lettuce. What does a let what does lettuce taste like? You know, <laughs> my friend Wendy says, you know, lettuce doesn't taste like ranch dressing. And you know, <laughs> lettuce just tastes like lettuce <laughs> and do, until you put something on it. So I always tell people to give give the wild edibles a fair chance. Uh, and and think about how you know the plants you eat all the time would, would taste uh, naked, you know, so to speak. But I use uh, violet leaves. Uh, you know, like lettuce. So it's usually a foundation uh, for the, the salad that we prepare. Um, the violet flowers themselves are edible and you can put them on uh, the salad. A lot of people make violet jelly. So you can make a beautiful, beautiful uh, jelly uh, out of the violet uh, flowers. And then remember that doctrine of signatures. Uh, I always tell people that, you know, uh, People once thought, you know, the language of flowers. People once thought that what something looked like uh, was what it was good for or what it represented. And so one of the most romantic things you can possibly give someone to tell them how much you love them is a bouquet of violets because of this heart-shaped leaves and the beautiful purple and, and, and green. So violets are incredibly common, incredibly simple, yet lots and lots of uses. And of course, dandelion. Um, is another, you know, and a lot of these things are going to be weeds uh, that I'm that I'm telling you about. But you know, the good thing about things that are weeds that are wild edibles is you don't have to worry about uh, eating too many of them. You you dig them up and um, you can use as much as you like. Um, this little mouse over here eating these red berries has nothing to do with the dandelions. It was part of the thing I found online. So just forget about the little mouse over there. Um, but dandelions when they're really really young. Um, you can use, you know, their, their young leaves as, as a green, you know, or just, just eat it in a salad. Um, you can, uh, you know, fry the dandelion heads and, and eat them at like fritters. Uh, people make dandelion syrup, people make dandelion wine, people make dandelion tea. Uh, so there's so many different things you can use uh, for, for dandelion. Uh, the roots can be roasted. When you roast the roots of dandelion in the oven, it smells um, just, just like you're roasting uh, coffee beans. It, it really does smell like something. And that's what you would use it for. You would roast the roots in the oven. You would, uh, after you get it nice and roasted, you crush the roots. And then you would brew it in your coffee maker, just like you do uh, coffee. Now, again, I tell people to be fair to things like coffee substitutes, because, you know, if you just drink coffee, um, it's going to be bitter and strong. Um, so I tell them if, if you're going to um, eat or drink something like the, the dandelion root for coffee substitute, you have to uh, eat it like you or drink it like you would your, your regular uh, cup of coffee. So, you know, when we serve dandelion root coffee, you know, we provide sugar and cream uh, to put in it so that you can doctor it up a little bit, just like you do every morning with your own coffee. Um, but dandelion's uh, fun and it's fun. This is a fun plant to, to uh, share with uh, kids because, you know, we always like to talk about where the name dandelion comes from. And the name dandelion comes from Dante Leon or Tooth of the Lion. And then that little uh, barb right there on the, or on the um, leaf of the dandelion looks like the a tooth of a, a lion. And Dante Leon is where the dandelion uh, gets its name. And then lamb's quarter. So people will sometimes say, what is your favorite wild edible? Um, and I'll say, uh, well, uh, lamb's quarters, because you can use uh, lamb's quarters just like spinach. And it, you know, it can get large like this and you can still cook it uh, like spinach. Uh, but you know, it's called lamb's quarters because it has little, little fuzz on the leaves that give it this little uh, kind of woolly uh, appearance. And so uh, this often grows as a weed, oftentimes in, in ag lands and it seems to really like barns. Uh, so it can be, you know, just as much as you want, you can harvest it uh, out of a barn, usually on a farm somewhere. It's not, it's not native, it's an exotic plant. So you can harvest as, as much of it as you like. 
Uh, but to me, this is one of those plants that tastes even better than the regular plant that we eat. The lamb's quarters taste better than spinach to me, uh, but you cook it exactly the same way. You can parboil it, you can steam it, you add a little bit of butter, a little bit of salt, and, and you're ready to go. And it's very, very nutritious. It has lots of calcium uh, in it. So it's, it's, it's one of the best wild edibles you can have that's, that's not only easy, uh, you can collect as much of it as you want, and it tastes really good, and it's really good for you. So it's it's a good one to to have. Then poke salad, of course. Anybody that grew up in the old South is familiar with poke salad, and um, you know we never ate it raw growing up. Uh, we always uh, ate it um, being cooked like a like a green early, early in, in the season. Um, you know, I see these little leaves over here, you know, they, you can just pick them and, and boil them or steam them and, and eat them just like a green. Once they start getting larger, you might want to par bowl them, which means that you bowl them, you pour, you pour that water off. It's after six o'clock, people are still calling me. Um, that's my, my state phone, sorry. Um, but you, you want to boil them, pour that water off, and uh, put fresh water in there and boil it again. And then that way you're getting rid of any, see that red coloring right there um, is, could, could be um, poison that would, would make you ill. It's not gonna kill you, but it's, gonna, it's not gonna be good. Poke berries are not edible. Um, you know, again, even though you see mockingbirds eating the poke berries, uh, they love poke berries, um, but um, that they're, they're poisonous to, to people. And again, Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot. Um, again, you know, this looks very much like poison hemlock. Um, you know, what you're after is a single stalked plant that has that big umbel at the top and it's the roots uh, that you would use as a carrot substitute. And you're gonna use it just like a, a carrot and it tastes very much like a carrot. That is one of the um, things that you learn with wild edibles is whatever part of the plant that you use, um, you pretty much um, prepare it like you would use that part of other plants that we use, just like you with a carrot, you use the roots. Uh, with a Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, you would use the, the roots and, and you would eat them raw. You could cook them, but most of the time we eat them raw uh, in salads. Um, you know, some people uh, will eat parts of this, uh, flower head, I don't, um, but, but some, some people do. I mostly just focus on the root of Queen Anne's lace and use it just, just like a wild carrot. And then red bud. Now, again, this is one of those that you need to, to know a little bit about the plant as far as what family it's in. So red buds are a lagoon. And, um, you know, these, these blossoms of the red bud is very edible um, and beautiful in a salad, but remember that it's related to peanuts. And so if you have a peanut allergy, you're also going to be allergic uh, to red buds. So you, you have to be um, very careful of that. So, you know, that, that's why you don't want that phone call the next day asking if we had peanuts because you think, oh my goodness. Um, but I always ask, if you're sharing this information with anybody, I always ask the group, you know, do you have any allergies? What allergies do you have? And we will be talking about plants and their families so that you'll know what to avoid. Um, and so with red buds, you would definitely want to avoid uh, the blossoms if you are allergic um, to peanuts. And then plantain. Um, plantain, you know, the, we get into a, a, a little bit of the, um, the medicinals here. So plantain, everybody's familiar with plantain growing in the, in the yard. You know, you've got narrow leaf plantain, you've got uh, broad leaf plantain, and it's a medicinal in that as a natural poultice. And what that means is if you were walking across the yard and you got stung by a bee, you could collect these leaves of the, the plantain and chew them up and then put that on the bee sting. And that's gonna draw out the, you know, the venom, um, 
the um, the sting and it's just going to make it feel better. Now, I'm not sure how much of that is um, the placebo effect, uh, but it does really work with kids. You know, if you have a kid, you know, on a hike and they get stung by a sweat bee or, or, or something you, and you find some plant and, and you know, they're just going to be so in awe of you sitting there chewing up a, a, a you know, plant out of the yard and then putting it on their hand, they're going to forget about that bee sting. Uh, but it has been used as a medicinal for, for many, 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 many years. Um, and it is to draw out the poison, to draw out the sting and to make things feel better. Um, Service berry, you know, service berry is one of the beautiful early spring trees. This is a native uh, tree uh, that often grows on hillsides and the service berry has a berry to it, much like a, a, a raisin, but very hard to, to harvest, very hard to catch it just at the right time. Um, but I have, you know, uh, found them and in, in eaten them and they taste like a teeny tiny little, little, little prune. But there are a lot of things out there that, that are berries um, that are good to eat. You just have to um, know when exactly to, to harvest them. Uh, and daylilies. So, um, I'm not sure if daylilies are native or not native. You guys can tell me that. When I was growing up, daylilies grew wild on our creek banks. Um, and, I, you know, I've always had daylilies in my yard. And people will sometimes, when they come to wild edible classes, they want to know survival plants. What are some plants that I can have uh, if things get really, really bad and uh, I need some plants to help me survive? Uh, and I always say daylilies, you know, um, daylilies are easy to plant, they're easy to grow, and, and so much of them are, are edible. Um, and again, it's the parts of the plants, you, you prepare them just like you would the parts of the, of the plant that you're substituting. For example, daylily roots are just like potatoes. Um, I often make uh, a root soup for our wild edible classes. And um, I, uh, you know, just basically, you know, get these roots, you know, I, whenever you're using roots, you have to dig up the plant, but uh, so much of the time you need to thin out daylily beds anyway. Uh, but you get this plant, you scrub the skin off of the roots, you boil the roots just like potatoes and you can make a cream of daylily root soup. Um, and, it's, and it's great, it's, it's delicious. Um, you can make fritters out of the um, daylily flour, uh, flour. You can take and um, you know dip it in egg and milk and put it in flour and fry it, and, and you have a, a fritter. Um, people don't believe it, but uh, these little uh, blossoms come in the buds of the daylily. Um, when you take them and fry them in butter and add a little salt, they taste just like asparagus. Um, so there's, there's so much of the uh, daylily plant that is edible, um, you know, from the flower to um, the buds to the roots, that they are a great edible plant to have around. Um, maybe not native, but they're, they're a good one to have. The other one that folks are, are um, kind of shocked to know that they are edible is greenbrier. Smilax, um, you know, something that Sandy Bivens used to call blasphemy vine because of these thorns uh, on the on the vines. She probably still calls them that. But um, but if you take Greenbrier or Smilax when it is young, and you again you take the shoots, and, you know, you take the, the early young growth, spring growth, but you can still find it now, um, and just only go back to where it's still tender, you know, just where you can still pull it off, where it's tender. And again, you fry that in, in, in butter, saute it in butter, you don't really need to, to fry it, and um, add a little salt to it. And again, uh, green briar will taste exactly like asparagus. People are amazed um, on that one. So it's a good one to have. And, and again, these, these things are probably just as nutritious as asparagus, you know, it's just gonna be a green. Um, that you're eating. And then cattails, um, they're another uh, good one. And again, they're, they're it's a native plant. It's um, abundant. Um, you know, folks have, when before these uh, turn into these brown um, 
you know, fruit heads, um, you know, these are the little young fruits and they're just, they're like corn on the cob. You can take and you can, can boil them, but they might have to be much younger uh, than this in order to eat them like corn on the cob. Um, and then if you let it go to, to where it's creating the pollen, the pollen can be collected and used like flour, but it's gonna take a whole lot of that to make any flour. Uh, what I have eaten on the cattail is actually the, the young little cattails that are they're in a wetland that's just beginning to poke up. It's just a new little cattail and uh, like a corn. And um, it tastes like cucumber. So um, again, you're gonna, you're gonna use it like in a salad. You're gonna eat it raw. You're gonna put it in there with your, your uh, violet leaves and your violets or your uh, red bud um, flowers. And then you're gonna add uh, some wild onions and a little bit of a uh, cattail, um, new growth. And, and you've, got, uh, you've got yourself a good salad. And then uh, a little bit more on the, um, the medicinals. You know, uh, you know, most of our, or a quarter of our, of our drugs are, are derived from, from plants. And, uh, but there are still a lot of good uh, native uh, wild medicinals out there. And one of those is uh, willow. The bark of black willow, um, you know, has salicylic acid in it. And salicylic acid is the same active ingredient uh, that's in aspirin. Uh, so, you know, you could take and, and, and dig uh, some of this, this bark off, boil it in, in water. Um, you can do the twigs the same way. Uh, and you're basically going to make yourself a liquid uh, aspirin. Now, is it as effective as an aspirin that's been concentrated and created in a lab? Uh, no, um, but you can make a strong tea and it is going to help you. It's going to help you do the exact same things that, that aspirin does. It's the same active ingredient. So it's going to help you with inflammation. It's going to help you with fever. It's going to help you, you know, feel better. Um, so it's, it's something good to, good to know. Um, and then may apple. Um, May apple is another one of those that you have to catch right at the right time of year in order to be able to eat that fruit. Uh, and the only thing edible about may apple is the fruit that's going to replace this blossom right here. And uh, in order for them to, to create this blossom and to create that fruit, they have to have at least two of these big umbrella-like leaves. Uh, they're not mature enough to make their fruit, which is the, the single leaf uh, may apple. So uh, you have to have two leaves to be mature enough and then the blossom, then you've got to be there at the right time. But this is one of those, again, one of those plants um, that, um, you know, there's a fine line between a medicine and a poison. Um, so every part of the may apple to, to us uh, is poison except for that fruit. Um, but, you know, it's shown promise uh, in uh, the use of, uh, uh, to help, um, cure, you know, used as a chemotherapy drug in the treatment of uh, lung and testicular cancer. Um, there's always a fine line between a medicinal and a, and a poison, a medicine and a poison. Uh, and you've got to know exactly what that is. But the black willow, it's easy. You know, it's just you boil the bark and it's going to be like aspirin. But this, this uh, the may apple plant could have uh, serious poisons in it uh, that can be used as a medicine, but probably not a good collectible wild edible. But you can eat the little, the little apple uh, that's formed right here if you catch it right at the exact right time of year. And then jewelweed. Um, again, I've, I've mentioned Wendy Hunter, who is my partner in these wild edible classes, especially the ones that becoming an outdoor uh, woman. And uh, she makes salves out of the, the jewelweed. Uh, she actually collects the plants, grinds them up, adds them to um, beeswax and olive oil and this sort of, but it's an incredibly good uh, aloe-like salve. And, um, you know, jewelweed's uh, one that if, um, you know, you get down on a creek bank, you get in a wet area and uh, you get into stinging nettle. Oh my goodness, stinging nettle is the worst thing. I know you guys have experienced that, but it's uh, jewelweed's one of the best things just if you see it growing. And, and a lot of times uh, stinging nettle will grow in the, the vicinity of jewelweed. Um, and you can just grab some of that plant, again, crush it up and put it where it's stinging. 
and it's going to help make that sting go away, just like aloe does for burns. Uh, so it has, it's very much like uh, aloe. Um, and then with the, the uh, jewelweed, it gets the name because if you put that leaf down in water, it's going to uh, glimmer like a jewel. Uh, but, you know, if you um, are just interested, you're never going to get enough nutrition out of this. But if you let these uh, fruits mature and ripen, inside of here is a little brown seed that if you were to eat it, tastes like a little walnut. <laughs> it's, not, it's just going to be a teeny tiny little thing. It's just for curiosity. Um, the main thing about jewel weeds is that they're great hummingbird plants. Um, they're great touch me nots. You know, it's fun for kids to, to, to grab these little seed pods and let them explode uh, like this right here. Um, and then it's good for both poison ivy uh, and uh, stinging nettle. It's, it's just a good um, salve. And then elderberry. Um, you know, an elderberry is... Um, being uh, kind of advertised as a great uh, e immunity booster right now. And, um, you know, growing up, you know, we would collect the elderberries and, and my mom would make jelly. My dad would make wine um, out of the elderberries. And, but, but Wendy makes a tincture. And uh, the tincture, uh, it, you take all these elderberries and you put them in pure grain alcohol <laughs> and leave them for uh, a long time. And the pure grain alcohol gets all the good uh, chemicals out of the elderberry and it makes a, a good tincture as a, uh, again, a, an immunity. And uh, so she does that. And, um, you know, people will also take this uh, um, flower, um, head and, and again you can put it in, in milk and egg and douse it in flour and fry it and end up with an elderberry fritter uh, as well but elderberry is supposed to be one of the best medicinals as far as preventive uh, medicine and then jerusalem artichoke jerusalem artichoke is blooming right now um and you know you have to know when to collect things so right now as the plant is blooming, it's exerting a lot of its energy. Uh, so you wouldn't wanna collect uh, the, the roots of the Jerusalem artichoke right now because all of its energy is, is being put into the flower. You wanna wait for all of that energy to, to uh, recede back into the root uh, before you start eating the, the root of the Jerusalem artichoke. And uh, you would eat, eat it very much like uh, potatoes or water chestnut um, the way I have prepared it before is you take, you collect the roots and uh, you clean them really well. And then you just, you wrap them in a lemon and, bowl and you uh, bake them, you know, and then add a little uh, butter and salt and, and eat them just like a, a potato. Um, but it's not starchy like a potato. Um, it has inulin in it versus starch and it's uh, not as sweet and it's not as bad for you uh, if you have diabetes. So uh, that's one of the good things about Jerusalem artichokes. And this is, again, is a plant uh, that you can plant um, because you don't see just huge masses of Jerusalem artichoke uh, in the wild to be able to uh, collect from. But I did see, see one blooming on my place uh, just today. And then spice bush. This is one of my uh, favorite uh, plants in that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's considered a spring tonic. Um, and this is a plant that you would collect the twigs in the spring and you would boil those twigs uh, and you would make a tea out of it. And it is said to thin the blood. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it, but it helps to uh, probably just the drinking of the tea, the, the boil water made people back in the day before freezers and refrigerators and, and having to eat things like potatoes and bread and, and uh, salted meat for the, for the winter uh, probably just tasted good and made them feel like their uh, blood was being thinned uh, and helped them to feel better. Uh, but uh, one of the best things about spice bush, I always like to have spice bush uh, around. And I, I have it growing uh, very abundantly wild where I live now. Um, but I used to would plant it in my yard because I want to see the spice bush swallowtail. 
So with, with spice bush, you can not only have the, the twigs that you use as a spring tonic tea in the, in the springtime, but you get the spice bush swallowtail coming and laying eggs on it. And so you get to see the caterpillars, those very crazy looking clown-like uh, caterpillars uh, of, the, of the spice bush. Um, but, but very cool. And then um, I'm just changing all, all different ways. Bob got really good pictures of these. Um, and then there's the chrysalis. Um, but one thing I also want to show you right now, going back, these green berries turn bright red. And so right now would be the time you, you'll see the spice bush and the red berries. Uh, now would be the time that you would collect those red berries and just put them, um, you know, in a, in a drying tray uh, and let them dry. And those red berries uh, harden. And then you use them just like you would use, a, um, you know, nutmeg you know, or clove, it's going to be a spice, uh, but you could literally grate those and use it as a spice, very, very similar uh, to nutmeg. And uh, that's one of the reasons it, it gets the name spice bush. You know, spice bush is also a good uh, shrub to know that, you know, when you're on the trail and you're hiking and your your mouth gets dry, um, you can you can chew on the twigs and it will help um, wet your whistle. It's not going to rehydrate you, but it's just going to make your mouth uh, less dry. Um, and sassafras, you know, sassafras is one of my favorite native plants. Um, it's so uh, cool to talk with, with uh, folks about it and share it with kids and adults alike. Um, you know, we, we often have the sassafras tea. Um, you know, and there are studies out there uh, that, that say that uh, the, the roots of sassafras, sassafras tea, if you drink too much of it, could be a carcinogen. Uh, but the idea on that is don't drink too much of it. So, uh, but just, just to taste it again with all of these things, you're not going to make it a staple of your diet. Um, but, you know, it's just fun to try. And if you had to, uh, you could. Uh, as you guys know, sassafras is one of the few trees uh, that has three different uh, leaf shapes on it, the sock and the glove and the, the mitten, um, like, like mulberry has the three different leaves. Um, and then what I will uh, tell folks, you know, that there's more than one use for sassafras. People use the roots to make the tea, um, but people also dry, well, I mean, we use it all the time. People dry sassafras leaves and sassafras leaves make filet. So when you're having filet gumbo, what you're having, the thickener in filet gumbo are the, the dried leaves of the sassafras tree. And um, whenever I used to do more hikes with kids than I do now, but when I did, if, if we come across the sassafras tree uh, and I had a would have a horrible kid, I'd ask if he would want to do an experiment with us and he'd always say yes or she, and I'd get them to chew one of the sassafras leaves and once they do that, it is a thickener and it will thicken the saliva in your mouth just like it will thicken a pot of gumbo. So um, I'd always get even <laughs> with the bad kid uh, in class by hitting, getting them to chew up the, the sassafras leaf. But, and then wild ginger, you know, uh, with wild edibles, what well, you'll discover, it's a lot easier to get the, the uh, spices, you know, to things than it is to get the whole meal type thing. Uh, but I love wild, uh, wild ginger. Um, it looks kind of like, um, like, you know, the violet leaf, but it's a little bit more roundish, a lot more fuzzy. You got this nice maroon flower here that's pollinated by ants. Um, but the root down here, you know, uh, that is very much like ginger. And you take, and it doesn't take much at all. You take this root and you boil it and it, it makes a very uh, good ginger tea. And so you just boil it. You, I mean, you don't even have to uh, add much to it because if you like ginger, which I do, um, you're gonna love ginger tea made out of wild ginger. Again, you know, you, you, whenever you're using the roots of something, you're you know you're using the the whole thing. It's a you know commitment on the plant after after that. But um, so I only you know I'll get a little bit of ginger root from here and a little bit of ginger root from there. Never all of it from one place. Uh, but I've got a lot of it on my farm, so I have enough to to keep me supplied for quite a while. And then persimmon, we were just talking about per, persimmons, um, and there are persimmons that have fallen to the ground, and they are uh, ripe enough to to eat. 
uh, you know, you, you have to be careful because if you eat a green persimmon, you're going to end up with what we used to tell your mouth turned inside out. Um, but incredibly dry mouth. It's just going to take all of the, the moisture uh, out of your mouth. And um, so you have to have very ripe persimmons, but not rotten persimmons, because I ate one the other day, tasted like wine. So it had already started fermenting. You know, the problem right now is when you're collecting uh, persimmons is to not get stung by a yellow jacket because they're, they're out there having a party um, on these persimmons right now. So you have to be careful enough to grab a yellow jacket. Um, but there's so many things you can do with persimmon. The, the name persimmon, um, you know, means persistent, persistent fruit. Uh, so, you know, Native Americans would dry this, um, get it dehydrated, and, you know, that would just be a burst of sugar. Uh, in the winter time, um, and then Diosporus, Dios means God, Pyrus means fruit. So the the genus for persimmons means fruit of the gods, and so uh, it, it it has a long history of people using um, the persimmon. I, I have a dehydrator. I think I'm going to try to dehydrate some persimmons this year. One year I tried to make persimmon leather. And I don't know what I did wrong, but I ended up with mold leather. So you gotta, you have to be careful uh, with that. But um, but I think a dehydrator is gonna help. But but you can make persimmon, you know, jelly. You can make uh, persimmon um, puddings. You can make persimmon uh, icing for for cakes and things. So you can you can do tons uh, of things with persimmon. And if you're into folklore, uh, you can even predict the winter. Uh, I have not looked at a persimmon seed yet this year. Um, but the theory is that the embryo uh, inside of a persimmon seed will predict what type of winter we're going to have. Um, if it looks like a spoon, uh, then we are going to have spoons or shovel, uh, spoons or shovels full of snow. Uh, if it looks like a fork, then we are going to have a mild winter. And if it looks like a knife, then we are going to have slicing cold. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a vague science, but an interesting one. And then someone held up pawpaws. Um, I, you know, I saw the largest pawpaw I have ever seen in my life floating down the creek the other day. So, I mean, it, it was, it was, this is it. It was large and I've already eaten this pawpaw. So I've already had a pawpaw this year, but now is the time. Now is the time to get out there and, and fight the possums and raccoons uh, for the, for the pawpaws. Uh, the Tennessee banana tree, the pawpaw uh, has these beautiful maroon uh, flowers uh, pollinated by flies. And, you know, oftentimes things um, that have, that are maroon in color are pollinated by ants or flies. Um, and then if you're lucky, you know, you can find a great fruit. And I, th I do think it's going to be a great uh, uh, pawpaw year. We just have to get out there and, and get them. And I think it's all this rain that we've been having. Um, wetlands, uh, wooded wetlands are a good place to look for pawpaws, um, and, but also alongside creeks. Um, and of course, the uh, pawpaw is the uh, host to our state uh, butterfly, the zebra swallowtail. So just a really uh, cool plant. You can make uh, custard. Uh, you can take the pawpaw pulp and, and flavor, um, you know, ice cream. So you can make pawpaw flavored ice cream. So it's, it's a, a great fruit uh, to enjoy. Oaks, um, you know, you can take the, the, um, the meat of acorns and dry them. You know, um, you, you, one of the things you have to do is you have to, um, you know, Native Americans would put them in a, sh a stream, take the, the husk off, put the, the, the meat of the acorn in a stream and let the water flow over uh, the acorns because, you know, oaks have a ton of tannin in them and tannins are, are very, very bitter. Um, so you would, you know, what you would do instead of putting it in a creek, you would take that meat of the acorns and you would soak them. The water will turn brown. You pour that water off. You put it in there. The water is going to turn brown. You pour that water off and you just keep on until the water doesn't turn brown anymore. And that means that the tannins have been leached out of the acorn. And it's at that point in time that you can, um, you know, basically meal the, the, the acorn meat, turn it into flour, crush it, turn it into flour, turn it into bread. Um, so if you Google acorn um, 
bread, acorn flour. They've got a lot of recipes uh, online uh, for, for that. So a, a fun one to, to try as well. Now, one of my favorite plants, you know, in, in the nut world is we have lots of um, black walnuts in Tennessee. Um, and we have some white walnuts in Tennessee. So uh, the butternut uh is the white walnut and you know people you know collect the black walnuts and there's lots of them and you can uh, wait until the hull turns black get that black hull off crush them uh and get that meat out and use the black walnuts you know in brownies or banana nut bread what whatever you want to use it for you can do the same thing if you have enough of the white walnut or the butternut now, uh, butternuts are actually a threatened species uh, in the state. Uh, so you wouldn't wanna collect too many of these. What I would recommend if you want to experience uh, white walnuts or butternuts is just get a few, let them turn black, get that hole off, um, you know, get to the meat by, um, you know, with a hammer or a rock or whatever you gotta use. Um, but butternuts, when you taste them, they are worth going to the trouble to taste because, uh, Butternuts, they're called butternuts because they have such a sweet meat to their nut. And, and to me, it tastes like you've added, you've combined a walnut and a banana. It tastes like banana nut bread before you ever get started. Um, and we always had um, butternuts on the, on the creek when I was growing up and, and they went away. Uh, you know, we had, you know, walnut uh, diseases uh, come through, blights, um, and, and they went away, but I'm starting to find these walnuts again in the similar place to where they used to be. I don't, I don't know exactly why, but I've got one really nice uh, butternut on my property uh, right now. I've got some that don't look you know, great, but then I've got one that's really nice. And I've been collecting the, the nuts and sharing them with Grow Wild and they've been propagating them and they've had a lot of success um, propagating the, the uh, white walnuts or the butternuts. Um, so it's a really cool tree. Um, the leaves look very much like black walnuts. It's these nuts. You can see with the black walnut has a round nut. With the butternuts, they have this uh, elliptical shaped nut. It's, it's longer. It's longer than it is wide. Uh, so that's the, the surefire way um, to uh, identify them. Um, they, they, most of them look like this right now. Some of them look like this, but most of them are just falling off of the trees. This is, this is taken, this picture was taken this year. Uh, they're just falling off the trees and they have the fuzzy uh, hull on them uh, still. But um, hoping we can, can keep work and keep conserving to, to bring the butternuts back because they, they're, they're a great tree, a wonderful tree um, to have around. And then tree ears. So these, uh, a few uh, things about um, mushrooms or, or fungus, you know, tree ears grow on the bark of trees. Um, you sometimes, uh, if you like Chinese food and you like hot and sour soup, you know, see the little kind of gelatinous thing inside of your hot and sour soup, that's tr tree ears, uh, not necessarily uh, this uh, species, but um, you can make soup out of tree ears. Again, you have to be careful because some people react to tree ears. So you'd have to, you'd have to sample it very, very, um, you know, uh, slightly at first. Um, my favorite thing about tree ears is the joke. You know why some trees have ears? <laughs> so they can hear other trees bark. That goes all the way back to my water park days. <laughs> when you said on the kids. But other mushrooms, just a few things about mushrooms. Um, you know, the, the easiest of mushrooms, uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you these three. Of course, the, the tree ears are a type of mushroom. Uh, oyster mushrooms look very much like um, oysters, but you know, they've got gills. Um, you know, they, they taste somewhat like oysters. Um, you can take and saute them in butter and have them with pasta. And, and that's a really nice meal. Um, it's relatively easy to identify. Uh, you know, with, with um, mushrooms that have these nice deep gills, some, some people like to soak them in salt water, just to make sure there's nobody living in there. 
uh, before you eat them. Um, but typically that comes out at, uh, when you cook them, saute them anyway. Um, this middle uh, mushroom uh, is a morel. This is my friend I was telling uh, Bart earlier about Anna De La Pinta, who does the, the mushroom classes on how to uh, grow mushrooms in, in your logs and things of that sort. But she also hunts mushrooms like these, these morels. Um, again, they're easy to identify. And again, one that you would saute in butter and have with pasta. Um, and then uh, her favorite, not my favorite, but her favorite is uh, chicken of the woods. And uh, chicken of the woods are this bright uh, yellow um, mushroom that, that grows on, on logs in the woods. Again, easy to identify. Um, and But you can't eat too much of the chicken of the woods. Um, and you cannot eat chicken of the woods with and have alcohol with your meal because if you do you will get sick 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 uh it's not a good idea to combine alcohol and mushrooms because then there's some chemical reactions some some mushrooms like inky caps prevent your body from being able to digest alcohol uh so that's not good and then these guys uh chicken of the woods if you mix alcohol with those you just end up throwing up and so um so if you have mushrooms, it's not a good idea to, to have a drink with them while, during your meal. This is what uh, chicken of the woods, sometimes it's that yellow color, and then sometimes it's just this beautiful orange and yellow, uh, and another um, morel here. All right, so that goes through a quick litany of uh, wild uh, edibles. I've gone for exactly an hour. Um, and uh, this is Methuselah. I don't know if all of you have seen this tree. Uh, this tree is at Arnold Air Force Base uh, in Sinking Pond. And uh, it's a, just an incredible, this is a really unique wetland that occurs there on the Air Force Base. And I don't even know if we could get back to that point now. Um, this was before 9-11. Now they've closed all of that off, but uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful tree. But I'd be happy to entertain uh, any questions um uh well we have quite a few in the the chat so um i'll start with the first one do okay. you have a good resource recommendation for what the most nutrient dense wild edibles are so for um, example i hear you say that something is edible but i wouldn't eat it unless i knew it was nutrient dense right so um yeah, let's go back to uh, our references. So this guy, let me put my glasses on. This guy right here, his name is uh, John Callis. And this book right here, Edible Wild Plants, that's what the focus is, is on the nutritional value uh, of, of the plants. And he's the one that says that the lamb's quarters are, are so uh, highly nutritious, even more so than, than spinach. You know, uh, Yul Gibbons talked about that quite a bit in stalking the wild asparagus, but now we know a lot more um, than, you know, when this, when this book was written. Eating on the wild side is the same way. It focuses mostly uh, on nutrition. Um, it, it also focuses on buying good nutritious food. You know, they talk about things like, you know, always buy the dark green lettuce. You know, that's why the, the violet leaves are, are so good for you because it's when it would be considered like one of the dark green lettuces like romaine versus, you know, iceberg lettuce, which is mostly water, um, which isn't bad, but, but still it's not the, the most nutrition that you can get. Uh, eating red foods, um, you know, because that's gonna increase your antioxidants. Um, so the, these two references, uh, eating on the wild side, I wish I could see that author, um, and this edible wild plants are two good references uh, for that. Um, Robert Davis has asked, uh, what about kudzu flowers? I've never tried kudzu flowers. Yeah, they're going to be they're going to be a lagoon, right? So, cat, uh, someone named Cat has has replied that kudzu flowers are good in jams and jellies. Maybe that'd be one way of getting rid of it before it seeds. 
-hmm. All right. So she said, cozy flowers are good. Oh, okay. All right. Um, something I need. I've never tried cozy flowers. Um, and then, yeah, I'm seeing some of these things, but but I, 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 I would think that they, them being related to the red bud, that that's possible, but I never go with those relationships, you know, because, you know, you got that Queen Anne's Lace and Jimson Wheat, or not Jimson Wheat, but um, Hemlock going on. So, uh, but I will definitely try that, Kat. Um, Arlen you're not, asks. You're not Kat Dearson, are you? No, no. Okay. What else? Uh, Harlan has uh, stated that carcinogen in sassafras is saffron. There you go. So you definitely wouldn't want to, um, you know, drink too much of that. You know, it's just so hard because it's such a crowd pleaser. Everybody loves sassafras tea. Um, you know, and uh, we don't ever let anybody have very much of it, but you know, it's kind of, it's almost like getting into heritage and history because people used to drink a lot of sassafras, um, but you would definitely need to be um, careful. Mm -hmm. Now the, the ginger root, you know, you know, is, um, is good and it doesn't have that in it. So you could substitute the ginger root for the, the sassafras, but thanks, yeah, saffron, very good. Robert Davis asks, how do you get the seeds out of a persimmon? You spit them out. <laughs> you put them in your <laughs> You put them in That's your mouth. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Robert. Um, uh, no, a lot of these things, you know, you, uh, I'll tell you what else is, is uh, in season right now, and that's muscadine grapes. And oh my gosh, the other night, um, you can't, I can't eat more than two muscadines because it makes my, it makes my lips start itching. And so I had to squeeze out the pulp of the muscadines and then eat the, you know, the inside and then spit out the seeds and um, I'm planting more muscadine on my farm uh, to try to have more grapes. Um, but so what you're going to have to do uh, with a persimmon is you're just going to have to mash it and, and, um, open it up and, and get those seeds that same way with a pawpaw you're just going to have to um you know if you don't want the peel you're going to have to slightly you know you know peel that little thin uh peeling off of it uh and then open it up and then just get the seeds out um i mean you could use a strainer you can use cheese claw um but pretty much it's a matter of of, of picking uh these things out um i don't do wild edibles on any large scale so um, typically I do enough for a group of uh, 20 or 25 to be able to sample um, these wild edibles, but I, you know, I don't make a, a huge amount of things. Now, Wendy, on the other hand, made enough of the um, uh, violet jelly to, to give out as uh, wedding gifts uh, for her daughter's wedding. That was what everybody got at her daughter's wedding was, again, because it's a symbol of love, um, you know, uh, violet jelly. Um, and uh, she kept saying, you don't know how many flowers this is. And people are going, oh, wow, you're giving me a jar of jelly. And there she said, it was so much work. So, but um, anyway, yep. Basically press and get that seed out of there and uh, take it from there mash mash it um and we have another question can you eat Tina, you're breaking up and uh, passiflora you. fruits oh sorry go ahead go ahead um go ahead karen if i'm breaking up no, do you but, eat the passion fruit that grows wild here yes yes you can um and so i again growing up, um, you know, you, you wait until it gets uh, turned from that green to a yellow and, and it seems like the outside starts getting thin uh, and, you, and it smells good. It smells like you'd want to eat it. Uh, and again, this is one of those things. So some of these things I've been eating for so long, I can't think of any other way to get rid of the seed except to spit it out because that's what I've been doing all my life. But, but with passion, uh, uh, by, we call it, you can call it wild apricot, um, maypop, um, 
you know, you just basically uh, break open that that fruit and you get the inside pulp and, and there's not much to it. So you're not gonna chew, you're gonna suck, you know? And so for us growing up, that was like candy. I mean, it was, it's a, it's a um, and you know, Passiflora is one of the flavors that they put in Hawaiian punch. And when you taste the, the may pop uh, or, you know, the, um, you know, the, the wild apricot, uh, it's gonna give you uh, a hint of Hawaiian punch, and that's the Passiflora. Uh, so it's a, so you can't eat that. I wouldn't eat the seeds and I wouldn't eat the, the skin, but you can definitely suck on the pulp. Or you can make a drink out of it. I mean, you could add, use that as a flavoring. Hmm. Uh, Julie Gately says, asks, is it safe to eat black walnuts with the 1000 cankers like, if that name is right? Yes, that name is right. Uh, you know what? The, the 1,000 cankers um, doesn't affect people as far as I know. And if, you know, if you can get, you know, nuts like the pictures I've shown, you know, that's, that's a healthy tree that's produced those, those good nuts and those good fruits. You know, they just get real gnarly and, and the, um, you know, they can't produce the, the fruit. And so, uh, so yes. Um, now, you know, you're, you're going to get like a percentage of them that's going to be uh, edible, but um, um, I've never not eaten black walnuts because of the thousand canker. Death by a thousand cankers. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, lots of comments. Thanks, Pandy. That was so interesting. Great presentation. Congrats on retirement. Yay. What about Tree of Heaven? I'm Horrible. Gonna... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've, in, I've enjoyed it. Um, I, nothing is edible on Tree of Heaven that I know. Um, you know, the only thing that's even remotely um, edible about it is, you know, it, it, the leaves smell like burnt popcorn. Um, but um, there's, I, to my knowledge, there's nothing edible on uh, Tree of Heaven. I wish there was. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think of ways to, to consume uh, a lot of our um, invasive plants. One is uh, wild mustard. You know, some places have, uh, or wild, uh, or wild garlic, sorry, wild garlic. Um, you know, some people have like these uh, wild uh, garlic mustard festivals. You guys know what I'm talking about, the garlic mustard. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that grows wild and uh, takes over areas. And, mm -hmm. and it does have a garlicky taste to it. And I've made a pesto out of it. And, um, you know, you take as many wild uh, garlic mustard leaves as you possibly can, uh, put them in a blender, add olive oil, add Parmesan cheese and add walnuts. And you've got, you know, anything's gonna taste good with that stuff in it. So um, I, I've made a really good pesto out of garlic mustard uh, and it's an exotic invasive uh, plant. So in, anytime I can consume those guys, um, it, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, uh, I just read a book on basketry. I'm trying to think of little baskets that you can make with Cerecia lespedeza. <laughs> So we can start weaving <laughs> Cerecia lespedeza <laughs> into something. Um, but, Anyway, this has been great fun. Uh, there's a message from Kat. She says, Kat Champlin. I oh, work okay. with Stuart Carroll at Virgin Falls. Oh, okay. Good deal. Good deal. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we have another great presentation. Thank you. What about the passion flower leaves? The leaves? Mm -hmm. No, I leave those for the uh, Gulf fritillaries. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's it. Whenever you can combine, um, you know, the, the edible plants with the plants that are good for, for butterflies, that's, that's just a bonus. But, but yeah, the, not, not the leaves. Um, I wouldn't eat those, but, but they're wonderful for the Gulf Fritillary. That's their, that's their host plant. And so you're going to be able to get those fruits uh, and have uh, Gulf Fritillary butterflies at, at the same time. Um, now, I have um, made uh, grape leaf 
um, you know, use grape leaves in um, like a like a roll up thing, stuffed grape leaves. Um, the thing about grape leaves is that you have to basically break down the plant fibers before you use them. So you steam them and then you freeze them and then you heat them back up and then you can stuff them with whatever you want to stuff them, usually some really good, good cheese um, and, and herbs. But, uh, but you can use uh, wild grape leaves just like you can use, um, you know, you can eat those, but you have to break down the fibers in it first. But there's a lot of recipes uh, for that, but they're good. I mean, they're good. Um, Another um, thank you for a very educational presentation. Thanks. On the dandelion, on the dandelion, it takes a lot of flowers to make the syrup, and my relatives in Denmark do that. And because I got practically a field of dandelion, and uh, and the kids kind of, I got the cutest picture of the of the child having all the flowers in the basket. And uh, and then the the grandmother was uh, was making the syrup, and she actually sent me the 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 recipe of it. But oh, wow. no thanks, I'm not going to collect dandelion. But <laughs> on the on the leaves, naturally, uh, uh, right after the after the war and during World War Two, it was. Uh, uh, we were using dandelion leaves for letters and the channel podium, you showed it as uh, uh, something, at lambs, as lamb's ear, but, oh. the, but the head of it was of, of the channel podium and you can uh, use a lot of that plant to make a, a salad off. Excellent. I, I would love to have that picture and, and that recipe if you want to um, send it to, to either my email or Karen's email and she can pass it on um, to me. Uh, that would be, I'd love it. I'd love to share both of those things with folks and add it to my, my presentation here. <laughs> um, Karen, can, am I still breaking up? No, you're okay now. Okay. I wanted to make a point about wild ginger root um, there is a carcinogen. It's actually a, a kidney toxin and a carcinogen in members of that family. It's called aristolochic acid because it's the aristolochiaceae, and it actually can cause, um, I, I don't, it's really, I was just looking to see what concentrations are found in, in that plant in our hemisphere. Cause a lot of times it's like South American, species that they use, but it not only causes your kidneys to fail, but then you get cancer in your failed kidney. I so it's a really bad thing. Lovely. So that might be something to investigate before you drink Too uh, wild ginger tea. <laughs> yeah. I always wonder, you know, how much, how, how much you can get away with. Um, Cause you know, don't drink it a lot when usually when we're sampling teas, what we'll use are the little cups that you uh, folks have in the, the bathroom to take medicine with those very little tiny yeah. little cups. Um, but still, it's good to it's good to know that information. So, yeah, yeah. I, I made um, uh, I made one of my friends turn pale when I told him that story because he makes a liqueur out of it. And I said, you know, you need to figure that out. And I actually found um, I have to research it a little more, but I found some articles about what the content is trying to figure out if it was at a harmful point, but that is a, that is a caveat, just the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen has a question. Is tree of heaven bark chewable? Hmm. I, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, there are barks that are like, you know, sweet gum. You can get the, the sap out of the sweet gum tree and um, chew it. Um, I'm not sure um, about Tree of Heaven. I've, I've never tried that. Um, I just consider it a stinky tree. So I, I, I've never tried that. <laughs> but, um, but we can always look that up. We can always look that up. Robert Davis asks, what about sumac tea? And oh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. I've had that one. 
Yep, yeah. A sumac tea is a real easy one. Um, no, it it is one that you have to again remember uh, what's giving us that flavor. And you know, sumacs of the the red berry. And people always say, "What about poison sumac?" Well, you know, only the sumacs with the red berries can be used to make uh, tea. And it's one you would never boil. It's a tea to where you would get um, cheesecloth and just put the um, sumac, uh, you know, fruit head in that cheesecloth, just run cold water over it and just gently, gently mash the sumac berries. Uh, and then a pink, a pink tea is gonna be created and it's gonna taste, um, you know, tart. It's gonna taste like, kind of like a green apple and everybody likes a little tart uh, flavor. Uh, but the reason it tastes like a green apple is because it also has malic acid in it. And so, you know, green apples have malic acid, sumac has malic acid. And so if you, you drink too much sumac tea, you're going to have the same effect as if you ate too many green apples. And uh, we all know what that costs. So, um, again, you kind of, kind of have to, all things in moderation, especially with wild edibles, for sure. But, uh, yeah. So, but it, that's a fun one to do with kids because kids really like it. You know, kids like sour things for whatever reason. Um, they like um, sumac tea and then they like sorrel, you know, so the, the, the little, uh, you know, shamrock like leaves of sorrel, if you just take that and chew it, it you know, it, it tastes like a sweet tart. It, it's going to be tart. Um, when I was growing up and we had the little yellow sorrel in our, our yard, you know, we would eat the little uh, seed pods that look like a little pickle and we would call them sour pickles. Uh, you know, so um, yeah, so they're, that kids love sour things. Well, Bart says, great talk, Pandy. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed being <clears throat> here. Appreciate it. Does anyone else have questions? Please speak up. Just mm -hmm. one other thing. Did you realize you've got a Turk's cap lily? It, you've got two day lily pictures and one of them is a Turk's cap lily? <laughs> yeah, I think that Turk's cap is just a better picture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got caught. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, that is a Turk's cap lily. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I had a question. I noticed I had to join late and I noticed it said it was recording. Will the recording be on the website or where? Yes, I'll post the recording on the same page as the, um, the listing for the talk tonight. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> And a little side note, lilies are toxic to cats. <laughs> that I did not know. I did not know. I didn't. I wonder why. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. They've got they've got some of those, probably got some of those um, you know, glycosides that um they're in the asphodel ACE. Don't ask me. There, but there's several things in those, you know, those monocot families that are toxic to, to cats. So I guess we shouldn't feed li lilies to the cats. Correct. <laughs> or, you know, or if you have a lily bed, make sure they don't get out there scratching around. If you have it, I, I actually have um, six cats, but they're all indoors. So. Um, Good for you. I know. I know. Yeah. You can't work for the Wildlife Resources Agency and have cats outside. No. <laughs> all indoors. Uh, my cats are all outside, but they're called Bob. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Any further questions? Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me. Enjoyed it. Oh, we've enjoyed that thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. You are very welcome. Very Give me those pictures of those dandelions. I'd love to see that. <laughs> love that. All right. All righty. I'm going to stop.
sharing. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Pandy. And uh, it's time to say good night to everyone. And thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. If you want, can get those the recipe and the pictures to me, Alice, that would be great. Does she have a website? No, no, she works for TWRA. Okay. So if you send them to me, I'll pass them along to Pan. Okay. No Good enough. All right. Well, it's been fun. I've enjoyed this, but I'm going to say goodnight. <laughs>